I loved him and his wife, Steph, man. I was a huge fan of that fucking show. Oh, man. Um, I, mean, I mean, going all the way back to uh, before you, mm -hmm. uh, back when I was a kid, I watched uh, Thunderbirds are go mm -hmm. uh, Captain Scarlet. Captain and Scarlet was, I mean, how screwed up of a, of a premise is that for a kid show? This guy has to painfully die every episode. You're just like, and all those paintings, those awesome paintings of like quicksand and like snakes biting them and him falling off of a building. You're just like, I got to tell you, I, I for years couldn't understand why there wasn't a fucking action figure. Right. Because those paintings looked like it was trying to sell me mm -hmm. action figures. Totally. So I would go looking for it and never heard of it, such a thing. I and think they, they tried to relaunch it, I don't know, like in the mid-2000s or something. I think there are some floating around. They they yeah. did in – it was uh, towards the end of the 90s, early 2000s, they did a um, the first CG animated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it was the actual family doing it. And really? And I, I, I thought it was out of their hands at that point. That's great. So I, I think that. his son was involved with that because Super Marionation was still used in it. And uh, anything that has Super Marionation is usually that's associated their, with, that's them. Okay. with the Andersons. And, um, and I do know that the new iteration of Thunderbirds Are Go is amazing. Because yeah. The, yeah, I've watched some of it. The sets and excuse me, a lot of the effects in it are miniatures mm -hmm. and the marionettes are no longer marionettes they're cg and they're put right. in mm -hmm. but I, I freaking love that show i watch it regularly on amazon um i also contributed when they were first doing it i became a contributor uh to, awesome. to their kickstarter yeah i mean anything that they did you got to look at that because like people just don't understand the amount of effort and time and craft that went into putting on those shows i mean everything that they did uh, what was the other one? It was, uh, you know, the, the one about the kid, the genius kid. Je kid. Oh, Jimmy Neutron. Yeah. Uh, and then there was, um, oh, geez, what was the, the captain before? What was the hell? Fireball. Fireball XL, XL 13. Uh, yeah, that was real. Yeah, that was way before. Yeah, you're talking like everything that you saw was built, and then they filmed it multiple times, and pyro and all this stuff. And it was like, Man. It, was, it was very Japanese the way they did it. Oh, I because mean. Because the Japanese were the ones who kind of started that shit in the 50s. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and then Jerry Anderson saw how they were doing it, and he just replicated it. And all of his shows were these miniatures. And, and by the way, I just watched the documentary on Amazon about uh, Galaxy Quest. A nice. And those aliens, when they walk, that weird walk they do, Yeah, that was the throwback to Captain <laughs> Scarlet. That's the awesome. way that the marionettes would walk yeah. into a room. <laughs> and ours would move Let's like, go over here. <laughs> yeah. And, and they do those great cutaways in the original Captain Scarlet and shit, where you'd see the marionette hand, plastic hand, moving towards something, mm -hmm. and it would cut away to a human hand, pushing a button, yeah, uh, pulling yeah. a trigger. And I, mean, I and you look at like so space 1999 and and ufo and all those where it's like i'm doing the same exact thing but i'm putting human actors human beings in instead of in mini using mi miniatures and marionettes amazing it's the amazing same process stuff. amazing stuff yeah it's like uh, yeah yeah growing up on watching that shit and and of course that eagle right there is not a uh, uh model kit that was bought that was scratch built by my buddy Brian Ray. Nice. And uh, he gave it to me. Uh, the only last thing that needed to be done was those exhaust ports. Uh -huh. And I added those on myself. Nice. He instructed me to get some of the disposable, um, uh, what do you call them, plastic uh, champagne flutes from Walmart. Uh huh. And then cut them the and put them on. Well, because the tips are already short. Well, I didn't get the – they didn't have champagne flutes. Those are actually wine glasses. So if you get up real close, it's just a little bit bigger than what you should have. Mm -hmm. But it looks fucking good right there on the wall. Great. That's awesome. And it's funny because I actually have the model kit. I'm not going to reach for it. It's <laughs> on the other side of the desk. But I actually have the uh, model kit, the official model kit. Haven't built it yet. I've got several kits here still needing built. I got the Lost in Space Jupiter 2. Nice. Um, I mean, you you used to have like this great collection, and I never really collected stuff except for comics. And you remember when I sold them all in '86? Because <laughs> you and I were friends in '86, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, I mean, I, all the way till I probably, you know, 
I left to go to school in what was it ninety? So uh, no, you left after I left. Yeah, because uh, you were still home when I left for the army, and yeah, then you then you took off I, that fall. Yeah, exactly. I I had, I just went down for fall semester at VCU. Yep, and I had <laughs> I had just graduated basic training and was uh, on break with uh, John and and Patrick at mm -hmm. their house. And I'm like, where's Matt? And he goes, oh, he left, man, for school. Because <laughs> yeah. I was like wanting to get a hold of you. I was wanting to get a hold of Brian Embry and have the gang hang out one last time because I, I I was pretty sure I would never come back to Virginia uh, mm -hmm. back then. And um, But it was – I at least got to see those two fuckers before I left. So – and um, – I. Did I? I think I tagged you on Patrick's page. I, I was like, "Yeah, you didn't need to I, I think I'm friends again." Yeah, I'm still kind of adverse to Facebook. And it, uh, it's funny because it's like I jo I joined Facebook, you know, when it was first, you know, coming out as like a thing, and then I just kind of gave up on it. I don't know. It was probably I don't know four or five years ago. Well, you didn't so really need I didn't it. neglect it. I was like, I, I check it out here and there and whatnot, but not. Every yeah, you had no drive. Day. I because personally, I could give a shit about it in a lot of ways, but um, uh, I I like the fact that it's a sounding board where I get to say some of the shit that I say. But I also like the fact that I can keep tabs on members of my family and my friends, <laughs> and that's primarily why I have it. The stalking. <laughs> well, I just yeah, but um, I, I just like to know what's people. going on with my. My nieces and nephews, in particular, because I don't really care about my siblings. Mm. Uh, I love them, but I, I really don't want to interact with them. <laughs> um, I, I I really uh, love checking in on my nieces and nephews, seeing what the hell they're doing, and mm -hmm. and then of course checking up with my friends, seeing what they're doing, and uh, why they're not talking to me. <laughs> May, you know, mainly that's the thing that's so funny. I would get on Facebook. And because at some points it'd be like, I hadn't checked it in like six months. And then these people were like, hey, what's up, blah, blah, blah. Well, what, why aren't you answering me? Why aren't, well, fuck you then. Why, fuck you. I'm not going to be here for anymore. You know, it's just like this progression over six months of like them arguing with themselves because I wasn't checking it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Like, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, I remember back in the day. You could get you could go without talking to somebody for like months, you know, and you'd be like, "Oh, we're picking up right where we left and off." And if and if you're an introvert, you know, that's just how you do things. Yeah, that's um, true. <laughs> uh, I actually find I socialize more with Facebook than I would in real life, uh, and it works for me because uh, I really don't want to socialize much. I don't mm. want to go to parties. I don't want to. Hey, we're gonna have a gathering. I'll have fun. <laughs> You know, can it's you, like can you videotape it. <laughs> yeah, videotape. Send me pictures. Send me, send me a video of it. <laughs> I'll Skype in. <laughs> yeah, I've actually offered to do that. You know, it's like because uh, I didn't want to go to a con once, and I said, just uh, put me on the table on the desktop. Yeah, put an Skype iPad in. there, and you're. <laughs> hey, stop touching my books. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't bend the corners. And like people be like, like, is that thing talking to me? <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking to you, you monkey. Buy but, something, uh, get away from my table. <laughs> or as you would say, you stupid goob. <laughs> yep, uh, the goob. The goob. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, because, like, uh, I have nicknames through friends that other people don't call me. Like, nobody – only you called me a goob. <laughs> and, uh, and Matt calls me fuckface. <laughs> of um, course. <laughs> and, I, and I respond to it when he, hey, fuck face. I always turn, yeah, what? And, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's weird. Like uh, John Alderink from Marvel, uh, amazing colorist friend of mine, really good artist too. Um, he uh, he called me, he calls me Gare Bear. <laughs> nice. Like the first That's time we ever thing. hung out, he, he, he says, you're just a big old bear. You're my, you're my Gare Bear. <laughs> you know, John Alderink. I love that guy. Uh, cool. He seems to have kind of left uh, uh, comics sort of mm. because you know he's a he's a dad now and he's trying to support his family. So he's doing stuff that actually brings in money. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you don't do comics if you want to make a lot of money. Uh, I, I mean, you can eventually, but. Uh, people go, man, you must be killing it with some of those books. You got a bestseller. I'm like, no, man, 
I'm a struggling artist, sometimes starving. That's why I eat a lot of carbs and got fat. <laughs> well, plus you're chained to a desk for a million hours a day. <laughs> yeah. And, it, you know, it's like, but like with, um, I was so excited when I saw you on Facebook. Uh, the first time I'm like, fuck yeah. Because I, because uh, you and I had talked back in the 2000s when you were, uh, uh, you know, I, I got finally got a hold of you mm -hmm. on a, a group phone. You shared a phone with a bunch of people. And it was like, I just couldn't see. Oh, yeah. Hold you. <laughs> I think that was 2004. No, might have been uh, probably, probably 2002. Two. I, I think it was. Yeah, it was between two because me and Bobby moved back from New York in after September 11th. And then we uh, were in Richmond. Yeah. So it would have been 2002 or 2003. One of those. Because then me and Bobby moved out of the slate pit in late 2003 so that's, i think the that's slate pit was the was guar's compound where we had all our you know practice spaces rehearsal spaces all that stuff you know yeah because um i want to point out you know it's like uh you always said you're gonna work for guar <laughs> and uh you used to have those little muscle men figures uh you mean you mean these guys <laughs> yeah those fucking guys and that's how i learned who guar was <laughs> and uh, I'm like, Guar, what the fuck is that? And 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 I tell people all the time, it's like, uh, I said, when when I saw Guar, I wanted nothing to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I heard them and I'm like, actually, you know what? I kind of like that. And because it's punk. Yeah. And uh, and I like punk. So you're the sole reason I ever listened to Guar. And I got Zoe. <laughs> I got Zoe listening to Guar. Oh, and, awesome. <laughs> and, um, but, uh, you said early on you, you wanted to, I, yeah, oh, I mean, man, like, I, so like, I want to work with them. I I had, I, yeah. I had no like ideas of like that I could do that. It was more like it, I wanted to do something like war. Like at first, I remember even the first couple of times I saw any photos or anything of it, I was inspired to go into the, my dad's shop and like sit there and work on costume pieces out of cardboard little to, little did i know at the time i was basically doing what they were doing <laughs> you know it was like hands on whatever you had laying around is what you made a costume out of you know and uh yeah it just it kind of became some pot go because when i went down to go to school there i'd met i'd already met hunter jackson who was one of the guys who had helped create war and don draculich and became friends with them before i even got to, got down to go to school and, and of course, you showed him your artwork. I hope. Well, that was that was a thing. Once Hunter saw that I actually could draw and and stuff like that, we started working on some of the concepts that I had flushed out in high school. He had a wrestling comic. I had a wrestling comic. So we jammed them together and created a project together that we did a self published comic at that point. And we just started making more comics. We had tons of you know ideas that we had flushed out, but. Guar sort of ended up sucking me in pretty quick. You know, like it, it was one of his fears was that become a slave. Yeah. Like, Oh no. Uh, all of our time is going to be devoted to doing this versus doing all those projects that we had originally had started. Um, but we, you know, throughout those years that we spearheaded, well, I, I I'll, won't take all the credit because he actually spearheaded Hunter Jackson did. Uh, Slate Pit Funnies, which was Guar's collective comic. Like it was all the artists of Guar contributing Guar stories and other crazy ideas that weren't necessarily Guar stories. Uh, me and him had been going to all these conventions. We were doing Dragon Con and we did the New York Comic Con for years and years. We were going to all these things and we'd met uh, Rob Haran, who is who was uh, uh, owner of Cirrus Comics, Cirrus the Comics. And at the time, he was he had Cry for Dawn and uh, Animal Mystic and all these awesome books that he was per, uh, uh, you know, perpetuating at the time. And uh, he wanted he was looking through all my sketchbooks and he saw this Sun and Moon character, and he was like, "Man, you should! I want to develop this. I want to develop this." And so I ran and I told Hunter that, and Hunter was like, "We're gonna work on a comic right now." And we went and we did that, and we ended up putting it in Slate Pit Funnies, you know, because it was. We're like, why, why would we give it to him when we got our own thing, you know? But 
I really wish I'd given it to him in retrospect. You know, it was like it, Slate Pit Funnies wasn't the home for that comic, for that strip. You know, it was me and Hunter had no reservations understanding that at certain points, Gore, especially in the 90s, Gore wasn't that marketable of a thing because the sexual aspect of it pushed anybody who Every had any type of money. boundaries, yep. Yeah, it was like, oh, no, you can't. What, how am I supposed to market this to mom and pop stores and do all that stuff, you know? Um, but that strip, that strip was marketed towards that thing. So it, it didn't fit, you know, it didn't fit in there at all. Here we had, you know, giant dicks and all this spew and blood all over the place. And then we had this kind of kiddie version of a, uh, essentially it was two guys trying to ask a girl out on a date. That, that was the entire strip, you know? Um, <laughs> but yeah. So anyways, that, that's, uh, sort of the intro, like it originally, we never even thought ourselves as, you know, comic book producers, you know, cause we were just like, this is a way to tell war stories and to flush out things we can't do on stage. Because uh, of budget or because of... Well, it helps develop the characters and yeah. give yeah. Uh, a, a, a lush history or background to that character. Yeah. And uh, and I like that idea because uh, there's something really um, interesting about that because you get to read the comic and then go see the live band. and Because uh, they, they kind of did something like that with Kiss, if you remember <clears> that, when they put out that one comic that supposedly yeah, had their that's... blood mixed into the ink. That's the that's the you know archetype. It was like we're a band that's very similar, and very theatrical. Yeah, and 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 it was like they were telling stories. I mean, later on when I think they got on to some other labels, I think they're still they might be with Dynamite or something. I, I can't remember who who has who's to putting out Kiss books still, but um, yeah, it's just like you can do a lot of stuff in in comics that you might not necessarily have the budget to do for a movie or videos or even on a live show uh, and elaborate. Cause I can tell you this uh, IDW is doing it. And uh, oh, yeah. I, I actually worked on one of the covers. Uh, oh, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I think it was the Paul, Paul Stanley cover. Nice. Paul Stanley was star child, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. That's Paul Stanley. Yeah. Uh, the guitar up. It was a really cool scene. And I worked with another artist on it. And, yeah, uh, IDW's, IDW puts out a lot of good stuff. Yeah, they do. Uh, Tom Waltz um, is the uh, senior writer over there, and he's, uh, we were business partners and we're close friends to this day. Nice. And uh, uh, he, he actually, I worked for IDW. You'll find this funny because I don't think you know this. Um, I actually got hired by IDW back in the 2000s as the uh, animation director to do animated trailers for their comic titles. Nice. And I scored the music to it, uh, directed or did the voiceover for it to help sell it. My buddy Mac actually did one voiceover for uh, Steve Niles and Bernie Wrightson's uh, Dead, She Said. Mm -hmm. And did this Barney. whole, you know, dramatic noir music. It was really cool. And so I'd been doing that for a while. And then Tom Waltz walks in and says uh, to Ted Adams and Chris Ryle, uh, hey, you know, Gary... He's a pretty good artist too, and they were like, "Whatever," <laughs> you know. And he's like, "No, seriously." So he went and printed out my portfolio and brought it in, and they hired me on the spot. And I never did any more trailer work. I just were they. My first gig was the A Team, working on that. Nice, it was a small gig, but I met Chuck Dixon through the process and became friends with Chuck. And uh, you know, but IDW is like, uh, um, it's it's always going to be my favorite publisher. Um, they put uh, out a lot of good stuff. I mean, yeah, I, I I collect a lot of their uh, titles. I, in fact, like one, I guess it was. Let me think. It was uh, when James Stoke Stokey went over to do the uh, Godzilla ones. I, I followed him over there. <laughs> it was like, yay, cool! And then he's just been doing tons of really good stuff for them over there. Um, I I wish he would. Do, I I don't know if you're familiar with that artist. He he writes and creates a lot of his own stories and he did this one called orc stain that was just amazing and i don't he, think i know that one. Oh man it is I, I always was like he needs to finish that <laughs> i think he got to like issue six and it just sat there and i was like finish it <laughs> you know like <laughs> but i understand it's you know you get busy with other projects and 
you got to go where the cash is and whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's that reasoning. way, man. It's reasoning. Um, I, I'm going to look up real quick to see if I can find it. Kiss comic cover here. Oh, nice. So, cause I don't know where it is on my hard drive. I'm sure I could find it. Um, I worked on Back to the Future, too, so that's one of the first things that pops up. I worked on Iron Sky. Oh, no, here it fucking is, right here. Oh, I uh, love Iron Sky. That was fun. And the second one was even crazier. <laughs> yeah, um, here, I'm going to pull it over here, and uh, let's see. I will pop it up. There it is real quick. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just uh, I hit a point over the last year where – I'm in my fifties now, and I, I, I'm testy. I really, uh, <laughs> I, I really don't really want to deal with people. Um, I don't want to get, and I don't blame IDW for this, but um, I'm not very, I'm not famous, so I'm going to get the, you know, the normal rates. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sorry, that's not enough for me. Yeah. So um, I just kind of strayed away from doing that that kind of work and uh, working on my own shit. And I'm actually redrawing a comic i did when you and i were fucking hanging out hell yeah S remember saint thomas yep i actually still have some pages that use xerox for me in my sketchbooks oh no shit yep god you are you know and i want to point this out you were my first fucking fellow artist uh buddy yeah and, and that's why <laughs> i always felt so close to you because um I understood you and you understood me Yeah, and uh, we spoke this language that, um, and I didn't have that with very many people. Um, you know, I, I've got close friends and just, it, it wasn't the same thing. Um, you know, we had this bond thing that just uh, was hard to describe. Jason Pankoki from uh, Champaign Urbana. Uh, he was my editor at a magazine. He and I kind of have that. But it's still nothing like what you and I had back in the 80s. And that's why, you know, for years, I missed that connection I had with you. Yeah. Because i got to be honest, I fucking hate most artists I meet. <laughs> Graham Nolan is one of the uh, – well, that's not true. Barry Branscombe and, and a lot of guys I've met that are all pros <clears throat> in the industry, uh, I get along with them. Mm -hmm. But I found t that um, a lot of the artists that I would meet were just – borderline commies and it just annoyed me <laughs> and i'm just like they were just so like I'm you know, they were just like uh hugs are important and uh <laughs> look, i'm not trying to dismiss the value of a hug but that is not what life is about <laughs> and i i just uh found uh, them and i made fun of them because some take themselves too seriously yeah i mean that's the thing. It's like this, uh, any industry like this, the, the people that's, that's why I love Gore a lot because that's what we're making fun of. It's that mentality. It's like, yeah, you, you really can't take yourself too seriously. Well, exactly. And my buddy Dave Frizzell or Drew Frizzell, as I know him, um, I was uh, the assistant scout leader with his wife for my daughter's troop, Girl Scout troop. Mm -hmm. And I met him through her and we became very chummy and he's a big, he, very good artist. And uh, he's worked with some big rock bands and just great stuff. Very uh, Gigerish nice. in his style. Uh, but um, so you would like him. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Drew, uh, like one day he was um, listening to me talk to somebody. And uh, and I said this and he, he says, can I can I steal that quote? I said, the problem with most of the artists that I meet is they forget that what we do for a living is only one step away from embroidered toilet paper. <laughs> and he just thought it's like, fuck yeah. And I'm like, yeah. it's really all it is. Yeah. Uh, they act like it's something monumentally important to society. And I'm like, fuck off, you know, go save a life, you yeah. know, uh, go, you know, go when everybody's running away from something dangerous and you run into it, that's when you'll impress me of saying something that that's important. Right. You start talking about artwork. It's something I do for a living. Uh, it's one step away from giving hand jobs on the corner. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. We're whores. Well, look, we're whores with art. There, there is value in all of it, but 
the, that that mentality, that entitlement, it's like being in the music industry for so long, I, I have seen this idea that what you do, no one else can do. And people want to have that superiority over each other, which is, it, it's stupid. There's no reason for any of it. Now, right. there's validity in these works if people find value in them. And that's how I look at it is the same way you do. I make fun of it because, you know, again, I'm not taking it that seriously. I always say like, you can grab one of my books and read it on the read it on the toilet. You know, that's where that's where you're gonna read it. You know, <laughs> you know. But in in a lot of ways, I look at it like this: if you can inspire or or entertain or pass on stuff to your fellow humans, hey, that's great. You're not being a fucking drag on humanity. That's a good thing. And I do agree with you that yeah, if you're putting that much value into it, then you should be aiming to make something that's you know, life changing or groundbreaking, you know, and there's, and there's people in the industry that have done it, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, if you're working on the serialized strip every week and it's, you know, you, you look at thousands and thousands of comics coming out and you're like, there's, you know, boxes and boxes of books laying around of millions of stories that I've never read, you know, or even looked at where's the value in it all the way across the board. You know, it's like that kind of thing. It's like, how great is it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, um, uh, cause I, I don't remember if you remember, I stopped reading comics in 86 cause I got mad over the secret wars. <laughs> yeah. Well, who didn't? <laughs> um, uh, it's like, um, I remember going cause I think you went with me a couple of times to buy some of the side issues that you had to buy to get the complete story characters mm -hmm. that I could give a shit about. Mm -hmm. And I can't even remember what they were. And that, uh, and, and so that was it ham-handed marketing bullshit at the time. It's like, you know, you're doing that uh, to affect sales of other books when it, it, it just at the detriment of the freaking story, you know? It's like that that was heavy-handed at best. And, I, I yeah, I, I And agree. a lot of us felt um, put out by that. Yeah, uh, exactly. Or put off by it more. Yeah, you're, you're, you're basically – it was to the sacrifice of the story. It wasn't – beneficial now if it was beneficial i'd say okay i gotta buy all these books but again it was just driving you to go buy this character that nobody yeah, cares just, about you know in the end the only thing that came out of that in my opinion that i liked was the symbiote and yeah. uh uh and i i didn't want to spend all that money to find that out and comics have uh you know increased their price too much uh increased the quality of the paper it's on uh which is the driving force behind the price going up yeah. and they need to stop that. They need to go back to newsprint. They need to go back to making them inexpensively and get those damn prices back down Yeah, and uh, get the readership back up. And, uh, but I don't know. I, I think the industry that we knew for the last uh, 50 years is in its death throes right now. Oh yeah, totally. It, yeah. it totally is. You're, you're looking at like this, there's always an angle, and and I think the angle always at this point is to the detriment of the storytelling, and that's the problem because that's what these books – that's what drove these books in the first place. If you're looking at the heights and the writers and the artists and illustrators who made this industry, that was the focal point. You know, you're, you, you look at uh, people like, uh, say, Chris Claremont – like, say, take the X-Men, for instance, Chris, Chris Claremont and John Burns – a uh, uh, whole cycle of that story that they've made 8 million movies off of and retold that story a million times now. That, you know, initially was the beginning of it, but it was, the, the story was amazing. And that's what drove that industry, I think, in, in, into that corner. But yeah. you're, you're looking at it like you, you don't have the same quality as, as those writers. You know, there's too many of them that are just writing things with an agenda instead of just going, can I tell a story? It's agenda over story. Yeah. And that's the problem I have. It's like I've said before, if you have a point to make in your story, go ahead, but tell a fucking story that's good. Yep. Don't throw this agenda shit at me and say, that's a story. You're right. You know, I'm a writer myself as well as a reader. And I know a story when I'm reading it, right. and this is not that. And um, uh, and that, it's funny because I tell people because Keith, uh, who I'm hoping will be able to join us in, in this and all, but 
Uh, I'm yeah. not putting my uh, yeah. expectations too high. He's got to whittle out some internet. <laughs> he got hit out with hit with that lightning, man. Yeah. And in great. fact, I just invited Devin in. Uh, uh, she says it's in the middle of rendering process, so I can't join because the computer can't handle it. Oh, she's no. a she's a Guar fan, and I'm oh. trying to get her to come in. Come on in. Um, Matt is so disappointed. <laughs> is crying. Why? And Why? this. Uh, Why does the internet suck right now? You won't <laughs> join. Uh, I'm trying to type with a bandage on my hand. No. And because uh, I sliced my hand last night uh, doing dishes because some somebody did a no-no, which I've said, please don't do that because I do, I'm the dishwasher and I would appreciate if you would not put glasses in the sink and then st set stuff on top of it. Uh-huh. And then you go in there. Set and the glasses on the side. Mm -hmm. And, but somebody put a glass in there and I reached in to grab something and slice the shit all the way, all the way around my finger. Ouch. And this is my third band-aid because it kept getting bleeding. dark. Uh -huh. Yeah, it kept bleeding through. And finally it's, it seems to have stopped a little bit, uh, even though I can still see blood seepage on here a little bit <laughs> on the back. But uh, I was coming out and I was ranting. I was angry. <laughs> and it's hard to make me angry. Uh, that How made me times? angry. How many and, times? <laughs> and I just kept saying the words, you fucking people. <laughs> you fucking people. Had it up to here. <laughs> I've, you know, you can tell when Gary's angry when he, he stops identifying you individually and just refers to you as an entire group as you fucking people. Because <laughs> I knew it was, it was one of the kids or Deanna, my girlfriend. I said, I don't care which one of you it is. You're all the fucking people. And I blame you all. <laughs> <laughs> and, Deanna, people. and Deanna was just like, here's a Band-Aid. And I'm going to fuck off now. <laughs> and she just walks away. <laughs> Because when I get angry, you know, it's like the best thing to do is just leave me alone. Just walk yeah. away from me and let me uh, <sighs> poke the bear. Don't poke the bear. <laughs> yeah. That's what Lisa, my boss, used to call me, uh, Lisa Nally. I love her. We're still close friends. I'm close friends with almost all my bosses that I've had over the years. Nice. And um, because we have really strong bonds, the last one that I was closest to just died of cancer last year. Uh. And I, it was devastating. Uh, cause, uh, even though I would probably never work for the guy again, because, um, it, it, the business didn't end well mm. and, uh, cause put a lot of effort into it and it just fizzled and it wow. died because of bad decision-making, but I stayed friends with that guy and, um, was made lead pole bearer at his funeral oh, and, man. uh, and you know, and it's, it sucks, oh, yeah. but, but, uh, at the same time, the thing is, is, um, I'm friends with my, all my ex bosses. <laughs> well, that's good. I mean, why why not? If if you had a connection with them, you know. Yeah, and Lisa Nally's one of them. I love her and her husband Mike. I think they're great people. Uh, I like hanging out with them. They're funny. Um, and and I even yelled at Lisa once, and uh, and she yelled at me for sure. In fact, uh, sometimes she would just come in and just be upset about something and just yell in my general direction. And I I and I remember one time she came in. Was angry about something that had nothing to do with me, just yelling, yelling. And I looked at her and I said, I want you to know you just shut me down for two hours. Hmm. I'm not going to be creating anything just to deal with the stress that you just gave me. <laughs> I'm walking away. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my head. She's like, Oh, I'm so sorry. And it's like, no, Don't worry <laughs> about it. I'm going to go drink some fizzy soda and that'll be good to go. <laughs> Pump some uh, Mountain Dew in me. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, it's like, I, you know, because like you and I used to get together, we have these creative sessions. You, you come over to my house when I lived with Patty, mm -hmm. uh, or I'd go over there to your place. Uh, we'd either hang out in your room or we'd go down to your basement mm -hmm. and hang out down there. Hell, I remember one weird day we were in the laundry room just sort of hanging out. I don't know what oh, that yeah. was about. Yeah. Uh, listening to punk music in there. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, and uh, and this is back before MST3K and and. You and I would watch movies and we would turn yeah, the volume down. Do the same thing. Yeah. yeah and <laughs> just make up our own dialogue. Uh -huh. And you and I would just like do the voices and shit. It was fun. Mm -hmm. First time I saw Akira was with you. Yep. <laughs> on <Dana>. VHS. <laughs> on, on high definition VHS. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because 
I have some band members who are a little younger who had never seen it. And I was like, what? You haven't seen Akira? How'd you not see Akira? You kind of go out of your way. It's like when somebody tells yeah. me, oh, I've never seen a Star Wars movie. I said, yeah. you kind of have to go out yeah. of your way not to see those. So yeah, like what's up with you? Anything that kind of equates to anime at the time, it was like, yeah, there was that. Later on, it was Dragon Ball. You had all these things that are like – went wild into the into into our culture from from those uh, genres and akira was one of those you know that was a lot of people's first introduction to anime you know and it's so funny because like you were a big gamer too yeah and um yeah, uh, I, I remember you were, the, <laughs> you were the first person i ever met that recorded your own games so you could go back and watch the videos and figure out where you went wrong or what mm -hmm. you missed and yeah. I'd never seen anybody do that before. And I, I was, like, fascinated by you doing that. And um, But, you know, unbeknownst to you, I was also a gamer. I've been a gamer since 1972 when Pong came out. We bought it. I had the console. <laughs> oh, and good old I, Pong. I gave, it, I gave it to my daughter. Uh-huh. And um, uh, it's, it's, uh, I still had the console. Nice. Uh, when my pe dad passed away, it was there, and I, I, I'm like, I'm claiming this as mine. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, along with his porn, no. <laughs> <laughs> I need those Playboys. Come on. <laughs> um, he didn't have porn, but <laughs> <laughs> he did when we were kids. We stole them from him. My brother, my, <laughs> my, my brother Jim and I would go into their room and sneak him out from under the mattress and uh, go off in the woods and look at him. Going, hey, that girl's got big old titties. <laughs> and, um, but uh, in the latter years, he, he was like uh, living the life of a monk and it was, he was really weird. I love him, but, you know, miss him, but he had some weird stuff about him towards the end. But uh, uh, we would talk about that shit and I would tell him about like, um, uh, all the shit we would uh, talk about when we were younger back in the 80s. And when I first told him about you, uh, he's like, how's your elfish friend? <laughs> Call me on the phone. How's your elfish Because I was always talking about you. I'm like, I'm like, I met this other artist, man. It was just like me and played games and stuff. And and uh, But during the 80s, um, after Kel's Arcade closed, I didn't play games for a while and I kind of mm -hmm. missed it and hanging out with you made me want to play games again. Yeah. But I did, I never got on with your game cause I didn't know shit about how to play. Uh, what was that one you played? Um, was it uh, something? It was Sonic. Well, uh, back then I think we were doing no, Mega, Mega Man, Mega yeah, Man. Yeah, that yeah, was Mega it. Man, and, and there was uh, cause when the NES came out, we had switched and we started doing like, Mario 2 or the second Mario Brothers and all those ones, you know, those side scroller kind of fun, jumpy. Yeah, and I I, I, uh, I had trouble understanding them at first. That wasn't <laughs> what I played. I got it. I'd go over to Brian Embry's place and play on his little Commodore mm -hmm. and play. Um, yeah, we uh, had a Commodore. <laughs> was it Elf? Elf Quest, I think. No, no, no. Uh, well, there was. He, he had the original. So I think at first he had. Uh, he had Ultima, and he had uh, because he would play Ultima all the time. Yeah, and it was an over where you're looking over yeah, the character. Yeah, and it was around. like very Dungeons and Dragonsy, where you like you zoom. And in. I enjoyed that. Yes, I enjoyed that. Left, right, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I enjoyed that because I understood it better at the time. And then mm -hmm. in the '90s, uh, I started getting back into gaming again, and uh, the late '90s, and I I I played that game. Um, the horror game uh, that was so popular. Resident Evil? Maybe? Resident Evil. Oh, yeah. my God. I remember playing that in the middle of the night. Nobody was in the room. I was like sitting, <laughs> yep, I was sitting with the controller, headset on. Then, then his dog smashes through the window. The controller goes flying out of my hand. Like, I'm like, oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> in the dark, trying to find the controller that just threw out of my hand. And I, I got hooked right back into it. Bought my GameCube uh, next and hated yeah. it. And immediately bought my first Xbox. And yeah. I've been an Xbox player ever since, uh, but pro level on, on some of it, like nice. Call of Duty. And um, uh, I just started uh, playing again recently with uh, Call of Duty on P PC. And um, nice. I'm finding it very frustrating, even though I'm using an Xbox controller. 
uh-huh. it, it's got a different feel to it. Oh yeah, totally. It's on the PC. Totally. So I've been wondering if maybe I should just hunker down and just buy another Xbox. Um, well, I mean, that's it, it's a choice because you know you're also paying. For, it's sort of redundant in a little ways because you're paying for another device that your computer can do and yada yada. You know, the the thing I would say about it, it would be is like if if you're gonna play other Xbox games that you can't play on your PC, or well, like Steam and all these other things that you can do emulators and things like that. You know, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I have I, Steam. I have a few games. I got. I play Mad Max on Steam. Yeah, because right now the only con- like quote unquote console I have, I got a Switch. That's the only one that I have because I've essentially moved to all online games. I've just been playing. It sucks because I had like I had been playing uh, BSG for. Oh yeah, look at that. Out. This was eight. No, nine years of my life playing Battlestar Galactica online. And last, I guess it was uh, last year, they just took it offline. And it was like, <laughs> you know, all that work gone. Bring it back. But, I'm excited because this year they brought uh, <clears throat> Blade Runner back. Yeah. And uh, Westwood game from 97. And it's a really good game. I have the original game. and But now they've upgraded it to be put on consoles. Oh, that's and awesome. I'm like hell yeah. Plus, they also upgraded the, the the game itself for the PC, so I'm getting me a copy of that here real soon. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays. I like God, I'm, I love gaming. I really do. That's oh, great. Um, but what happened with me though with gaming, and I don't know if this ever happened to you, I would get on there to relieve stress because I like killing people, <laughs> and I don't want to do it in real life because I'm pass yeah. a pacifist. That's why uh-huh. I became a medic, but. In the virtual world, I will kill the shit out of people. <laughs> Shoot you in the face. <laughs> I will mock them afterward. I never did the teabagging shit. Yeah. Uh, a lot of my friends did, but like I've got friends on Facebook that only know me f- through Xbox as Cohen's Ghost, and uh, which is the artist name I use when I release my music because I don't right. like using my real name. And uh, so these guys all knew me as Cohen's Ghost. And like one guy was like, like the band? And I'm like, it's it's not a band. It's just me. <laughs> you put out that music. And I'm like, yeah, two CDs. Yeah. No shit. <laughs> Are you fucking with me? And I'm like, no, I'm Gary Cassell. You go look at the copyright holder on, name on it. It's mine. And he goes, God. And he went and checked. He goes, I've got two of your CDs, man. You need to sign them for me. And I did. <laughs> he mailed them to me. I mailed them right back. Signed. Uh, but I don't have like a, a fan base, even though it says I have one. I don't really. Nobody bugs me. Uh, I mean, a lot of times when I play these games, I don't even mention it. And on Battlestar, it was like three years before anybody found out that I was in Guar. And my wing commander, it, it turned out like at, like about 90% of my wing w- were fans. And then I was like, whoa, yeah. you know, okay. And, and the same thing goes with like the comics I worked on. They're like, you <laughs> No shit, you worked yeah, on like, Army of Two? And I went, yeah, I worked on Army of Two. Yeah. For EA. And they're like, yeah. holy shit. And, and I, I found this thing that was really funny though, was like when you know, like when you're on TeamSpeak or comms with somebody and you hear their voice, you sort of get this <gasps> mental picture of what they look like. Yeah. And I found out I was really bad at that game. Like I was like, everybody I met, because uh, I started having them come out to shows and meeting most of my wing. Uh I was like, you don't look anything like your voice. Like, it, I'm just terrible at this game. Like, it's it's like, boy, I pictured somebody completely different, you know. Uh, but it was cool That's for, funny. like, you know, nine years to have a group of strangers just playing something for fun and – that's kind of why I like my wing. Cause and most, did you build did you build some friendships on there? Because I did. Yeah, because a lot of people, you know, like our wing commander, he was a really nice dude. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where his wife had gotten cancer and we were commiserating with him and having these, you know, there was all these. It, it, and it was funny because then people really showed their true co- colors of the wing when he had to say, I got to take some time off to, you know, uh, deal with my wife at this situation. Uh, it started a lot of infighting about like, like I'm gonna be in charge, you know. It's like, like it's just a game, you know. Like, come on, man. It's 
Yeah, but it, it, it takes up so much time because, like, I'd play Call of Duty, and sometimes I found, and this is what I was going to get at, is that I would end up putting almost too much time in oh, yeah. Yeah. gaming. And it's easy to do. I was losing time that I'm supposed to be working on shit. Yeah. And that's why I got rid of my keyboard because I saw giving up doing music for a while less important than, than giving up gaming. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and, uh, you know, but I, you know, I developed some really good friends on there. In, front, in fact, Carlos uh, and, and uh, Brian, uh, God, Ricky, all those, Ryan, all those guys uh, are all on my Facebook page and they subscribe. They actually follow and they like it when I fuck with people. <laughs> and that was what they liked when I was on Xbox is they, they're like, nobody fucks with people like you. You, you say <laughs> the most, abs- like I pretended to be retarded once, mentally retarded. Oh no! <laughs> I walked into the room. Hi, my name is is Billy. I live in a group home, and the guy that takes care of us in the group home has an Xbox, and he said I could play with you. <laughs> so I promised him that I would not hurt his KDR. I think he called it KDR. And uh, but okay, just but thank you for letting me play with you. And I would get on, and my buddies would all just be quiet. They they didn't want to laugh out loud. They'd mute their microphones because they're rolling. And I and I would I would slaughter everybody on the other team in a battle, just uh-huh. slaughter them. And we come out of the room. I go, that was that was fun. Thank you. I'm sorry I broke all your players, though. <laughs> Don't be mad at me. And it, they were like, it, people would ask, like, is he really mentally? Retarded? I mean, my, my some of my stranger interactions with people, especially because like with uh, Battlestar, they set up a team speak. And they had a general like room where you could go in and talk to everybody. Then you had your own wing command rooms where you could like private chat. And uh, the general room would just be full of, I mean, <laughs> it's like, where are these people at? You know, what are they doing? The cuckoo bananas, you know? <laughs> it's like I liked it back in the old Halo days. Yeah. Because um, right. yep. uh, if you got close to a player, they could hear you talking. Mm-hmm. And I would walk up to him and I'd go, hey, how you doing? You look, you got a pretty bottom. <laughs> and the person would like be looking around. And they, Psychological that, warfare starts. And I'd walk up with my <laughs> rifle and go, bam. <laughs> <laughs> Butt strike. <laughs> and it just say the most messed up shit to people. And yeah. like kids, I hated kids. I hated kids. Oh, man, there were, there were so many trolls. I mean, people would start infuriating things on the comms. They had a, they had a, uh, uh, universal chat, and then they had a system chat, and depending on what you were watching, there's people having just heated arguments about the dumbest stuff, you know? And you're just, oh, yeah. Like, well, you get these shit-talking kids about 10 yeah, to 12 yeah. years old coming in here. It's like, I'm going to rape you. Yeah. Like, kid, your balls haven't even dropped yet. <laughs> and But then I decided to start messing with them, and this is the one that, that Carlos would just die laughing when I would do it. I'd start talking like the uh, the, the gay character from Family Guy. Oh, I oh go, no! I go. Oh, hey, how you doing? <laughs> What's your name, little girl? What's your name, little girl? I'm a boy. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> so, I have to because of Megan's law. I have to tell you that uh, I can't be within fifty feet of a child. <laughs> does Does this count? <laughs> and I'd say fucked up shit. So, do you have hair down there yet? Because I like them smooth. <laughs> <laughs> Drove them, drove these kids out of the room, and everybody would be dying laughing, going, "Dude, you know how to get rid of kids." And I'm like, "Yeah, man, just be perverted." <laughs> yeah, and well, um, it, you know, I, it was crazy because th- that BSG community. I was playing on an uh, an American server, and they had servers all over the the world, um, and um, I had. Uh, because you had the two fractions, you had the Colonials and the Cylon. Of course, I'm a plain a Cylon for fucking sure. And uh, the head pilot, because I was a strike pilot, I, I flew a War Raider. That was my, my jam. And the head strike pilot over on their side, he was the best player in the game. And I had I had fought against him so many times because I was just trying to learn how the hell he did his stuff. And he respected the fact that, like, I figured out how he was doing his stuff, but he also respected that I wasn't talking shit, and I wasn't – I was just there to have fun. I was there to play a game, you know. And it, and when we met on comms, he got so, you know, like, wow, this guy's just here for fun. 
that he wanted to fly with me all the time, but we were on opposite teams. So he was like, come to my side, come to my side. They, they were going to do a fraction switch and you could swap sides and keep your account. Right. And I was like, no, I love Cylons. This, the kill, you were outnumbered 12 to one. You had, you, you had good times anytime you got on there. And when the fraction switch happened, he wanted to fly with me so bad. He came to my side and I was like, you know, this is awesome. You know, we, we were just out there to have fun. And that's how I see a lot of those games. I, I, I feel bad for people who get caught up in like the ego part of it being like, well, it it's, defines it's, me as a person when it, it's like, no, yeah, I, I knew a guy like that and uh, he was in our clan and I would intentionally get on the opposing team during practice <laughs> and I would tube the shit out of him because I knew it made him mad. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I won a cl uh, clan uh, clan match uh, for my team, last man versus him, because he had left us and joined another clan. And he's like, oh, well, get him. He had no idea I was watching him the whole time. And <laughs> my entire team is watching through me. And uh -huh. I've got my sights on him, and they knew I could nail him at any <laughs> point. And then just for shits and giggles, I popped up in my tube, and I dropped the tube right on top of him. Killed him instantly. <laughs> And he was cussing, and I, I said, "Yeah, I know, dude. It sucks losing." It I mean, it, losing. you know, it's it's easy to get caught up in the moment and be like a heated and have a heated. Oh, response. he's just that way, you he know. But he was, he was God's gift. Now Ryan Anubis Jackal is what he went by, uh, and we're still really good friends. He was one of the last people I visited uh, in Phoenix when I left, and uh, that dude was a beast, and he he was pro level. And mm -hmm. he taught me, I would just kind of like follow him and uh, run and gun. Don't, yeah. don't, don't camp, run and yeah. gun. And yeah. uh, I would constantly move, stick and move, stick and move, stick and move. And my KDR went really high because of what I learned from him. Yeah. And, uh, and I took it. And there was a point where I actually considered myself going pro. And it's like, I'm not, no, I'm too old. I'm too old, nobody wants Never to pay. Too old for that stuff. Never Nobody's going to want to pay some fat old guy to play. <laughs> uh, I'll look like one of those uh, creepy characters hey, from the South internet's Park. Full of them. The internet is full of them. What are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, so I, I focused more on my art career, and that's when my art career really started taking off. Was around 2011 because uh, it was a struggle for a while, and uh, I. Because I know that you had your ups and downs too. Oh, yeah. and, but that's what goes with being an artist. It's like, yeah. it, it's like if this is what completes you, then you're going to suck it up and drive on. Yep. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, well, ultimately, that's like, you know, a lot of the people around here also agree. It's like you're doing it for the love of doing it. That That's why you're doing it. Not, you know, to the end. If you can make tons of cash off of it, great. But the idea is that, you love what you're doing, you know, because there's no way war would have happened this long if people didn't love what they were doing. Right. And I, you know, because like uh, my favorite song was a cover they did. Um, <laughs> well, was it the Kansas one? Yes. Uh, oh, my God. Good. I cracked up laughing at the whole beginning. My wayward son. Yeah. <laughs> and like at first I was like, are they actually faking it? Are, no, <laughs> no. Like, I know the words. I was like, was what the hell? That was always the toughest thing with Dave. It was always funny. You'd say, you're doing a parody or you're doing a cover. He would always confuse the two. Like he wanted to do, uh, what was it? It was uh, it was Medieval Woman was, it was something like, what did he call it? It was Werewolf? No, I can't remember. He basically wanted to parody the song versus cover it. And he kept saying cover it. And we're like, what do you mean? You know, like if you change the lyrics then you're parodying it. You know, you're not covering it. Covering it is singing the same lyrics, you know? And uh, and that was how he looked at all those. When we started doing the Onions uh, AV Club, that's, where, that's why all those covers came out. We were never satisfied with just doing one song. It was always like, oh, well, let's mishmash, you know, Pet Shop Boys with Sig Lopper and then do this, that, and the other and make it a mishmash because – Essentially, that's what gore usually is. It's a mishmash of a whole bunch of different ideas, you know? Right. And uh, I got to show you, I wouldn't have even heard that song if not for this guy, Rob Bankus. Um, you'd like him. He, remi <laughs> he reminds me a lot of you. 
Um, uh, <laughs> but he does this thing that even I do now. It's like uh, all my friends, I, I talked to you about this the other day when we talked. It's like uh, if somebody is a real close friend of mine, little things they do, their little idioms rub off on me. Mm -hmm. And he has this one where he goes, bick, 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 bick. It just <laughs> makes ridiculous uh, uh, words. Oh, I don't want to show that picture because it's got his kid. <laughs> there he is. Okay, let me uh, open this up. That's Rob Bankus. Nice. I like the, the Dr. Evil. <laughs> yes. Um, Rob is, uh, a, you know, he was with that band I told you about, the Overdogs, uh, punk uh -huh. band. Uh, and uh, I'm friends with all the bandmates, even though they broke up uh, or just sort of fell apart. It just, right. Like they some got, bands do. They grew up, got lives. and yeah. uh, But he's gotten back into playing guitar, which makes me happy. And uh, uh, I like it when my musician friends go back and refine their instruments. Yeah, and because uh, I, I miss playing drums and playing uh, keyboards. Uh, yeah, cause I don't have a drums or keyboard here, and so I'm looking forward to eventually getting it and creating some new music again. Well, luckily uh, I still have I still have my Fender here, <laughs> Fernandez. Nice <laughs> with the blue. Hey, string. play us a song, Matt. No, I'm terrible. <laughs> no, I'm awful. Thank I'm you very much. But. Uh, you know, so, you know, once again, I want to go back to the fact that you always predicted that you would end up working for Guar. Well, um, it, it, it wasn't like, you know, it was, a goal, like motivation. It was just it was like an idea of like, I, I really wanted to do. In fact, at the beginning, when I left school it, or left to go to school, it was like I wanted to do something similar to Guar. Like I was like, man, it, it, it the idea was especially at the time it was so over the top like there was no other band doing that type of interactivity uh the creativeness of the costumes and the music all jammed together i mean i always looked at it like a, more of an art movement than a band because the 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 fact that you had all these things if you started on on peeling the onion and see that they did develop a mythos they had a reason for all of this stuff that was happening and their commentary about humanity was it was very sound it was uh, there was a lot of really uh even though it was kind of scattershot the original uh a few records the ideas were there you could see like wow there's this vast universe of storytelling and and ideas already there in guar you know it, it was it, a man when i first started hanging around these guys the, the idea that people that were my like mind like a creative person you know, it always goes back to that idea when you meet somebody who's like, oh, you draw and you do this. <laughs> yeah, there's, the, there's that bright-eyed kid and the other dude over there. <laughs> That's you and me in 1987. Yeah, I think I'm wearing my lone wolf and cub shirt in that one. You were. You were. Uh, you're the reason I got interested in lone wolf and cub. And, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, that uh the Misashi story. And that's, for... and that's Patty's car, the that Buick Oh, Skylar. right, that's right. Yeah, and you and I just, my mom it, bought me. <laughs> I, look, I look back to the, the mid to late 80s, and it's like the person I hung out with the most other than my girlfriend was you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the ice cream shop you worked at was the hangout. You know, that was where we'd go to hang all out. All the skater stuff. punks, all the skater punks would come there and hang out. We'd sit at that one little table by the window. Yeah. <laughs> I'd put coins in the jukebox and we'd listen to all the, the latest music. And I'd work on artwork or yep. do crazy stuff, man. It was great. And that dude that owned the shop, and apparently that shop is still there, that sandwich shop. Really? Yeah, that dude. I don't think you were there that day. Uh, it was the blonde haired kid that you and I were talking about. I always forget his name. Was there that day and another dude. And all of a sudden, this guy storms over because. We were laughing outside, and he heard it, or he was outside, and he heard us laughing. Came in and tried to start a fist fight with me. Oh wow! And I look, look, dude, I'm not scared of you, but I'm not going to fight you. And what one? I wasn't laughing, you nor these kids were laughing because I said something fucking funny. Uh huh. Because I'm a funny guy. I don't need to <laughs> mock you. He was a paranoid dude, and and, <laughs> and when I joined the army and came back to visit everybody that worked at the shop because I was friends with everybody else but him. I walked into the shop in my uh, uh, Class A uniform, and I'm like, eat shit, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you That's wish you funny. looked this good, <laughs> you psycho. But, um, yeah, we're just two long-haired weirdos. Well, you and, and Pat, you, Patrick, uh, Brian, and Bree and I all yeah. had long hair. 
Yeah. And uh, Father Weems referred to us as the long-haired weirdos. <laughs> well, get on, get we long-haired <laughs> weirdos. <laughs> basically what we were. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Those are fun in, times. In Stafford, Virginia. I mean, come on. <laughs> we were on the fringe back then. <laughs> I, and it's funny too because I remember like even that jacket I was like I was fighting with my, my mom to get me a leather jacket for so long and she kept but you gotta have a nice jacket and I'm like come on man that jacket screams 80s like nothing else <laughs> let's right. go with yellow and gray ski jacket here yeah I need to find uh, oh there was that one newspaper where you and I were um Doing portraits of the people at the nursing home. Oh, yeah. There we go. I remember that. Yeah, that was cool. And there you are with Melanie. Oh, man. You got to send me that picture. That's amazing. Yeah. I think I, well, I, I thought I tagged you, but I guess I'll re-tag you on yeah, it. Yeah, please so, do. So I, have, do is download it. I have absolutely no pictures of her. She took them all away from me. And that's <laughs> the character that started out as Mr. Nobody. And it was you. Yep. It was you walking around with a paper bag on your head. Yep. And um, um, I kept saying it looks like a marshmallow, so it became a marshmallow. Yep. yep. And I eventually just sort of uh, said, hey, man, let me play with this thing. Mm -hmm. And I started writing stuff, and you had the, all these ideas, and I started pulling those ideas in there. And uh, I wanted to make it an R-rated comedy because I wanted there to be the whole sex thing in there. Yeah. Because he, cause he's so short and it, yeah. it would be funny to put him with like a regular size woman and like, you know, deal yeah, with exactly. mechanic. And, <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the running jokes that I wanted to put in there was that, oh, you're right. It never loses its shape and it's always sweet. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just thought of all these perverted things to add in there. And then uh, what was the thing that I threw in? there was um, all the strength of marshmallow with none of its weakness. Yeah. <laughs> Which was a throwback to the the Hulk. Yeah, or, right. No, Superman. Superman was Superman. Yeah, it was Superman. Superman. Probably Superman. Probably. The strength of steel with none of its weakness. Like, what? What's the strength of of marshmallow? <laughs> I'm not sure if I brought any of that. But I did figure out how he became Detective No. But he was originally um, police officer Nathan Brody. Yeah, he. he and he gets. And he got a uh, he um, wanted to warm up his marshmallows because he liked them soft, and put them in a microwave. But Doctor Big Brain had um, um, souped up the microwave so it exploded, and he was covered in irradiated uh, marshmallow. Uh, marshmallow. <laughs> and the only thing on his name tag that uh, survived was in NB. Yeah, N B O D Y, the letters. Right. So he became they call started calling him nobody, and he had his dad's detective badge, <laughs> so, which was partially damaged. Uh, that was what I ended up writing later on because I was like, how did he? Because I had to come up with like, how did he come about? Yeah, originally he was. I think I, I I'm gonna try to find. <laughs> it was. I don't know if you can see this. Let's see if we can. Uh, this was oh, there you go. Some of the like, you know, that was you. That's more for nobody. Break. Yeah, this was the that was the bag on the head version, right? Yep. yep. And then I think as we started to progress, uh, we got into the. Let's see, I find it there. If there's any that it's funny because this is I've been for years thinking about just redrawing the strip that we wrote together. Because, uh, yeah, this was, like, some of the uh, original. Oh, oh my God. I always loved the way you did the eyes. And I did uh, I did googly eyes, too, but I couldn't do googly eyes the way you did them. <laughs> well, I had my know, own way. It, it's it's better, you know, as, as he progressed. That's, well, that's how I did the eyes. Yeah, right as there. he progressed, it's better to have the brow so you have the expression, you know. It's like. Well, there's this joke I wrote in there because uh, I was thinking about you one day. And it's like we had the whole cigar thing just seemed funny to me. Yeah. And it's like, exactly. so I explained to him, he's like, hey, if you don't have a mouth, how are you smoking a thing? And he <laughs> says, I'm not smoking it. It's purely for attitude. I could, I love that. Look at that. He's, 
And then Detective Nobody takes the cigar out of his face. And he goes, because if I put it up here and he shoves it into his forehead, it just looks weird. So I yeah, put it down like, here. Yeah, and I think I think then at that point, like, right, this I think was one of the more later ones that I did. Yeah, I started to try to get that idea of creating, you know, less yeah, of the yeah, yeah. eyes. The gu- and you're doing the, the gun, the uh, what do they call it, the uh, Nixon? Yeah, it was, the yeah Nixon, it was the Nixon something – uh, annihilator. Yeah, yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, was something like it. But the funniest thing is, my parents still have that big. I did a full illustration of everybody at the time in the Detective Nobody universe, and it, it's in my dad's uh, shop. It, at he actually still displays it right now, even in their new house. It's hilarious. It's still there. <laughs> oh my god, uh, I still have pages of artwork that um, I, you know, I just don't know. Uh, I want to get around to doing it, but if I do it, I want to do it with you. Oh, hell yeah. Because that's one of the reasons why I sought you for so many years trying to reconnect so we could do some of this shit that we wanted to do together. I know, right? There's so many many cool ideas on the table. (laughs) Oh, like, still, I think back on that story you came up with that was hilarious, uh, Time Lords, about these two idiots that were kind of just basically you and me and uh, doing stupid shit and... Oh my god, it was funny, and it was really kind of a, a as much as it borrows from the name from Doctor Who, it was really more of a kind of a nod to uh, uh, what do you call it, um, Keanu Reeves movie, uh, uh, Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted, because mm-hmm. we're kind of like that anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, God, just such good fucking times, and I love the artwork you did, um, and I like the shit you do now. In fact. Uh, my girlfriend's uh, uh, brother, Alex, I showed him the logo you did for the bar. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> he owns a, a bar. Uh-huh. And uh, and he has kind of a nice logo, but uh, uh, the print out of it is too pixelated. I didn't like that, so I, I told him I would redo it in Illustrator Vic- mm-hmm. so he'd have a vector copy of it, cleaner, yeah. so he could print it to any size and not lose quality. But um, uh, he was like fell in love, and he's a, a – a retired uh, uh, pro skater too. Oh, nice! And um, he just absolutely loved your artwork. Oh, and uh, <laughs> so, but we need to we need to do a book. I don't know what it'll be about, other than Detective Nobody. Obviously, we got to do Detective Nobody, and uh, but uh, we need to come up with something of our own. That's just yeah. something new. And uh, yeah, it's grown ups, something we can come up with. We, yeah. We're the grown ups <laughs> since we became full fledged, not, not that that's going to change the humor or anything at all. <laughs> Still going to be 12th grader, <laughs> maybe yeah. 10th grade. I used to tell people level. all the time, it's like uh, I was in my 20s, and my, my closest friends at the time were in their freaking teens, <laughs> yeah, because I was so juvenile in my behavior, uh, which was what was attractive about me to, to like Patty. Until she got to know me, she goes, "Oh, you are actually kind of a teenager." <laughs> and I went, "Yeah, I, well, that's." I never grew up. I suffer the Peter Pan syndrome. Yeah, yeah, me too. A, a lot of it's funny because that's uh, creative people tend to go into that, you know. Yeah. Uh, never land. <laughs> we tend to be outlandish, kind yep. of silly, uh, focused on being creative rather than uh, focused on other things. And, uh, but my current girlfriend seems to like that. She just laughed. I don't know if you can hear her. She just, <clears throat> she laughed that nose. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause I, when I always meet people that talk about that, like it, it's such a weird thing. Like, how do you come up with all these ideas? Like, I don't even know. I was like, were you ever a kid? Like, did you ever imagine stuff? That's all you're doing. You know, you're yeah, just. Yeah, when you play G.I. Joe. Yeah. You know, like coming up with stories. That's it. You're coming up with that. The conflict and resolution. Hey, what do you want? You know, easy enough. And uh, so we, you know, we always had fun doing that shit, uh, hanging out. And uh, I'm curious uh, if it's going to be as enjoyable as adults doing it. And I I suspect it will be. Yeah. Um, With uh, a detective, nobody in particular, uh, I would actually like to throw that on the table for, if not later this year, for the first of next year. Yeah. Um, I've got. If I survive this virus. I know, right? (laughs) Damn it! Uh, yeah. If the comic book industry survives, yeah, we're calling it comic uh, apocalypse. Yeah, man. I mean, I 
I don't even know like how mom and pop stores are going to stay in business. And I predicted that a majority won't open their doors on the other end of this. Ah, it sucks, yeah. man. It sucks. We we went to we've got th it's like three or four really good shops in town, and I feel bad that I can't support them because you know you, they they get they're closed. Everybody closed. It's like such a bummer. yeah. And and it's because uh, like there was one in Fredericksburg. Uh, right across from the Hardee's in that little Victorian strip mall. Oh yeah, it was like a little biz bunch of businesses. Was that was that was that on um, Princess Anne Street? I think was that and Max's Comics or something. That was it, Max's yeah. Comics. Yeah, and um, that was uh, you know for a long time uh, uh, that was the last comic shop I ever visited. Well, until it, dude, those guys. It, that was the funniest thing. I always tell the story. I was like, I remember the summer. That I walked into the comic store and they were talking about the Dark Knight and the Watchmen series, and I remember I, that. Wait a minute! No, no, no! Wait a minute! That was in uh, just before you took off. No, that had been eighty. Shit! I think those came out in eighty six. So oh, okay, because I remember going to that shop <clears> and <throat> how uh, I talked to the owner because once again talking about Batman. Because of um, the new um, movie coming out. Well, yeah. So that would have been that have been closer to ninety because ninety was when that movie came out. But yeah. the Dark Knight had come out a few years before that. And oh, the graphic the only, novel. Gotcha, yeah. The gotcha, only gotcha, reason gotcha. that I had read, you know, I was like I had started reading independent comics. I'd started kind of weaning myself off of mainstream. Once I found out, like, you know, I'd already understood heavy metal. I already understood two thousand AD all these other ideas of how to tell stories. And I mean, you look at 2000 AD, man, that shit's just, you know, all those writers. It and blotto. Artists. Yeah, it was blotto. It Ooh. was, uh, now uh, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Was it you or Jim Woodward that got me to read, uh, the dark Knight it, and, it, and Watchmen? I think it was me because at that point, right. That's what I was. That's what I was getting. You and I were hanging out the most. I, I, I didn't said. know about that type of stuff because I was like, I was slowly getting into those types of comics, and those comics were just starting to be a thing where it was like a mainstream character telling this type of just crazy dark or <clears throat> realistic story. You know, it's like the Watchmen. You're like, who was writing stuff at that time that was like that? You know, there was a few, but not like that. Like you're like. Shh. Man, you know, mind blowing stuff, and I feel like that opened the floodgates for a lot of that type of storytelling. And and yeah, you can take comic books seriously, and you don't have to be like it's just about these superheroes and yada yada yada. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I mean, I ended up getting all those issues because the guys at that comic book store were just fessing about how amazing those stories and the artwork and everything was, you know. I, right. I liked Frank Miller's stuff at that point anyways. He'd done that Electra series, and and uh, I think he had – there might have been a few other ones like that. Uh, I had ended up getting that Wolverine poster where he's a check and all those ninjas. That was all Frank Miller. It was, like, amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah, because uh, uh, Frank Miller really impressed me. Oh, um, yeah. And I liked both his writing and his artwork. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, Even though he's gotten sloppy over the last few years, yeah, uh, yeah. both in the artwork and in the writing, uh, but man, uh, he he, you know, he had an impact on how I drew him. Yeah. And uh, later, when you and I became friends, Mike Mignola. Oh, Mignola, man, hands uh, down, totally. Because remember, the first artwork I did for St. Thomas was very Mignola-ish, right? And because uh, uh, I liked the way he did his shading, I like, and I still use Stark. I don't use cross hatching. I don't do any right. of that crap. I like having solid darks. Uh, yeah. I like everything to be a solid dark or a solid white. Yeah. And uh, with a little bit of edge feathering. And uh, so. I mean, I know like that was the thing. A lot of the so like uh, Hunter likes a lot of cross hatching in his in his art, and I always felt like, well, you're really limiting your ability to color it or to do something more with it by doing that because when you color it then it just turns into a mess like you, you're you're trying to make shadow where there's all this hatching in the middle of it you know like ah you know 
And yeah, it's uh, like, uh, I think there are only a handful of uh, artists that can do it. And I'm friends with uh, one of them. I was friends with the other one, but he died is Bernie Wrightson. Oh, and, and Kelly Jones uh, and Kelly Wrightson, Jones. Yeah. It, Kelly Jones is the heir apparent to, to Bernie Wrightson style. Yeah. Um, but Bernie just um, uh, was really into um, uh, doing this amazingly detailed feathering and hatching, and but that's that uh, thing. If you're if you're really being mindful of it, if you're really trying to make it so that yeah, when when you look at something that Bernie writes and has it's a black and white in color, it looks amazing still. Like there's just this you know quality to it. Whereas if you're trying to do an underground comic style and you're and you're just not quite thinking it out. You're just trying to create depth with black and white. It's not, it's not forward thinking because you're not going to use, you're not going to use that in color. You're going to drop half that shit out. It's not going to look good. It's just going to look like a muddled mess. You know, it's too much black in there. So, uh, no, I, I agree. Bernie was, it was going to those conventions. That was the best part because here we're, we're perceived as just these rockers. A lot of these guys didn't, understand that we were doing our own comics and drawing and stuff and meeting them and getting tutoring and counseling from like, we were sitting at a table and I was, uh, I always had my sketchbook with me back in the day. Now it's an iPad, which is ridiculous, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I'd always have it and I'd be eating something and then drawing something. And Sergio Aragonis came up to me and he was looking, he was like, can I look? And, and he thumbs through my book and then he sees my thumbnailing process for, creating strips were, I mean, I would draw a teeny little bitty thumbnail. Like here's the page is like that big, you know? And he's like, why are you doing that? Like what? Draw it to scale. You know, is it your work? You, you're, now, your work, you're talking work. about the Sergio uh, that drew Groot, right? Correct. Yeah. And yeah. he was the nicest dude. Like he was so nice and he was very helpful and he was very like respectful of like telling you the realist, the, the realistic, aspects of comic book drawing you know it's like you you the likelihood of you going in there and making a lot of money is eh, you know yeah it's like um only, uh, less than 10 percent of uh comic artists uh actually can make a living yeah off of what they do and uh, it's unfortunate because there's a lot of talent talented people out there and there's a lot of people that well this are, is where conventions have really come in handy yeah, because uh, I know a lot of artists. In fact, the other Sergio, Sergio Cariello, who's uh, was a Marvel comic yeah. artist, did a lot of amazing Spider-Man artwork. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, hold on a second. Let me uh, pull one of his pieces up here. Um, here we go. Open this view image and turn that on. Yeah. And Sergio is going to be in the next interview. See, uh, like, that I like, do. Like, right there is the perfect example. See that hatching, that, that, that line work in his underarm areas and stuff. That's proper use of it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not overdone where you're not letting that color seep through nicely and stuff. Yeah, look, look at that detail it's that he puts amazing. in there. That's great stuff. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to have him on. Um, uh, he was supposed to be on last week, but... Um, uh, we had some car trouble, so uh -huh. I w wasn't able to make the interview. And um, but uh, we plan to have him on again uh, uh, this next week, and uh, uh, I'll send it to you the link to it so you can watch it. Nice, excellent. Because uh, uh, I like talking to those guys, uh, these guys that have been around for a while that yeah. got to, to work with some of the Silver Age artists and writers. Mm -hmm. Like I had Graham and Chuck Dixon on, and they, they talked a lot about that, and all Rick, Rick Stassi too. Uh, or Stacy, I'm sorry. Right. He says he says I was saying his name wrong. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, because you're Italian. He goes, yeah, but Stacy is German. I'm like, okay. <laughs> For some reason, I thought Stacy was the Italian way of pronouncing it. He goes, no, you are wrong. And I went, well, you're Italian. <laughs> I will take your word for it. And uh, and all those guys got to work at, at DC and Marvel in those days when yeah. some of the guys that were coming up in the uh, 60s and 70s. So <laughs> I love that shit. Time, and the time period. <laughs> Yeah, he said, oh, what's in that? What's on that hat? Iron Man, nineteen sixty-three. <laughs> Iron Man. Yeah. Buddy. Um, the guy that I really wish I'd been able to meet, I'd missed him at a couple conventions because we we were at it was Mobius. Man, I really had wished I'd been able to meet him. Jean Claude uh, 
What was his last name? Yeah, the I always forget how to say it. <laughs> Amazing. I'm, I mean, honestly, like hands down, I was like every time. Uh, so I was friends with uh, the guy who ran the Javits Center convention in the '90s. His daughter was always like helping curate and run around and take care of the artists and stuff. And she had sketchbooks full of different amazing famous artists that just here do me draw something for me in the sketchbook and the mobius ones you just look at it and you're just like god i suck i just suck this guy is so freaking good like to try to aspire to be that good like at that level where it looked like he just pen pen drawing his 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 three-point perspective was some of the best i ever saw (laughs) <laughs> um, and then on top of that, he could do a western and yeah. turn right around and do it sci- science fiction. Uh, world he was building, just world yeah. building, though. World building. You Amazing. look at an artist at that level, and you look at all those worlds that he would build. I mean, just fully all the mechanics and, and, sh- and his shading. The way he did it was so different from anybody else. Mm-hmm. He would do he would do contours. Yeah, the lines, and then follow that contour, and co- follow that contour, and then lead it to a, a dot in a smaller dot, and it would that gave you the, this imaginary concept that filled, you know, in our brain told us that that shading. I yep. understand that, mm-hmm. and our brain understood that, and visually it was so pleasing. Oh, totally. I mean, I, I, there's not many pieces of his that I'm just like, oh, you know, I. I look at a lot of those guys from that time period, especially guys who were contributing to heavy metal at the time. You just look at a lot of the art they did, and you're just like, I fucking suck. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> you know, it's like, Corbin Corbin lives by me up here. Oh, I love Corbin. Far. Corbin uh, is so amazing, man. He's so amazing. He's I will never, never get him on the show. He is he is so introverted. I'm sure. <laughs> he, just, he won't. You know, he won't do shows like this. Um, he just wants to kind of stay in his studio and keep to himself. And that's you know, it, it's weird because I saw as the progression in technology when he when he started doing some of the Den stuff uh, digitally, I was like, he's still doing stuff that you're just like, how are you doing that? <laughs> you know, what? Tell us your secrets. Tell us your secrets. You know, like <laughs> yeah. Just like shake your head. Why? 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 You know. Yeah, I I converted to digital uh, in 2010. Yeah. Uh, because Photoshop had evolved just far enough. Yeah. That I could put the airbrush away, and Deanna's seen it. I've got a nice Pache airbrush. I have a big compressor, and I just don't use it. Um, I do everything through Photoshop. <laughs> I do my. Pe- yep. <laughs> I got sick of cleaning those things, dude. Well, it's funny because we still paint all our props with them. <laughs> yeah, because that's real world, you know. Yeah. So yeah, you gotta. But uh, but digitally, I've been finding I still love Photoshop, but Procreate is the shit. It's awesome. Uh, who puts out Procreate? I think it's an Australian company. Uh, I've been trying to reach reach them because I want to do some tutorials with them, and and uh, you know. For all the sort of like easy, like on an iPad or a tablet with the response of the, the pens and stuff and the brushes you can make and the brushes you can get. Uh, it's an it's a it's a Mac app. That's uh, you can do it on – I'm pretty sure that you could – it's cross-platform. You can do it on uh, like oh. Android, uh, iOS stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, like if you have like a what's – the, what's the equivalent tablet? I can't remember what the other one is. Oh, uh, for – for Android, I don't know yeah. what's yeah. what is the name of the uh, app. There's, I mean, uh, uh, iPad version for an Android. Is it a notebook? Is that what it's called? Oh. You know, the little pad to draw on. I, I might be I might be uninformed, but I'm I pretty I'm pretty sure I've seen a lot of different artists on Instagram and stuff that like. In fact, a lot of comic book artists are using Procreate right now and. Now they have another version of uh, what is it? Used to be Ma- Manga Studios called Clips Studio. Now, I uh, think. yeah, I used Manga for a while, but my problem with Manga is uh, I hate the pencil program, but it's, I love their yeah. inks. the The newer, the newer, yeah, the inks amazing. Yeah, I love that. But the newer programs that uh, I've downloaded for my tablet, 
they're a lot like procreate now and it's a lot more fluid it's not the pencil doesn't feel like you're just like you know it you know it doesn't beat the visceral part of like actually having a pencil to paper but they are starting to make screen protectors that feel like real paper and uh and it and it reacts the same way uh yeah it's really funny you bring that up because like uh, one of the most embarrassing moments of my life was uh, I was sitting down doing a, a, a pencil for a storyboard for a movie, and uh, I needed to erase something, so I flipped the pen over because uh, the stylus, actually the back of the stylus has, uh, when you put it on backwards, it, it's an eraser. Right. You got the... And, yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> so I was drawing something like, ah, crap. So I went and I flipped it over <laughs> and started erasing it, and then I did the classic brushing. Uh-huh. You're like, Afterward, nothing there. <laughs> then, mid swipe, I stopped, and then I just turned to my left to see if if Anybody's my daughter watching. and my girlfriend was <laughs> watching. And both of them were like looking at me, smiling. And I went, oh, damn I it. know. They the, saw me do a boner. The All craziest right. thing is like, I'll I'll switch back because I do. We've got like a light table. This is this is a, me and uh, Bob's graphic studio where we create a lot of the artwork for Guar, and we've got a light table over there, and I'll draw stuff and transfer to Bristol or whatever. And I'm sitting there and on procreate you enable to enlarge, you got your pen and you got your other hand and you can do this motion where you zoom in or zoom out. Right. And I'm sitting there on the piece of paper and I'm like, you know, just doing it to the piece of paper. You're doing the opposite. Yeah. (laughs) Like, no, it's, Real world, back to real world. You know? Yeah, because um, I'll do a control Z to undo something. Oh, you know, drawing that's, on the, paper. that's tap. And I did that a couple times too, where you tap the screen. I'm like, yeah, because like for what me, it's, I do, it's, I do. <laughs> it's control Z. And I'm yeah. like, tap, tap. Yeah, and I'm like, what the funny, fuck are you man. doing? You're drawing on paper, you idiot. Yeah, your brain gets caught in that like repetitive motion, you know. Like, oh, man. It gets, it gets trained. I mean, I, yeah. I feel like. The, the the thing I always talk about with young artists who are up and coming, I was like, you need to learn both techniques. You can't just rely on all digital because there's people that I know that I've met that just like, I've done all digital artwork ever. And I'm like, man, what happens if you want to create something? You don't have your device. You don't have, you know, you don't have what you need. It's like pencil and paper. You can find that pretty much anywhere, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and it also is good to learn your craft as much as you can. So learn it all, learn all of it, you know, not just rely on one platform. And it's not as limiting. I look at like painters like Bisley, who you try to do that stuff. You know, you can get good quality stuff from digital, but there's something about having the paint to canvas or Bristol that it's really hard to emulate. Like it's very hard to do that digitally. And, uh, I find that richness of actually having the physical piece is just like, it's nice, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I, I kind of miss sometimes when I, I paint, uh, with real paint on uh, cold press illustration board, right? The, how it absorbs and has that rough texture. Yeah. Um, I'm going to throw some stuff up here real quick. Of <laughs> now that's one of your pieces there. Yeah. That's and... a, that's an older one. <laughs> and um let's go here <laughs> yeah and that's some pen and ink right there yeah that's on uh uh illustration board yeah like that and this is oh use blue line that's that's from clip studio that was a tri- tri- show work in progress of like a layout and initially that was a i think we did that one as a pitch to in fact it was uh dark horse we were pitching to dark horse to oh yeah you told me about that the other day yeah yeah we were trying to do like uh get a graphic novel uh mythos telling of the whole band like i've been working on that for a while now to try to just have one uh trade where you can basically here's the entire history of guar you know that you can be introduced to Guar and not have to really, you know, dig around and find all the information. Yeah, it's like uh, I was talking to somebody about um, uh, dealing with uh, Dark Horse, and what was your experience like with them? They're, they're really nice. I mean, the the thing that we've had, you know, 
we're always like in house and we've always tried to do control everything and be like, we're going to write the story. And if we can, we're going to do the artwork, yada, yada, yada. And initially those guys definitely wanted to just, you know, we're going to put some story guys with you and some artists with you. And yet, you know, there was a lot of that, but you know, they were very nice about it. And we just kind of like, yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a sticker I just did for, uh, uh, Sawborg. Uh, Sawborg. Yeah, Sawborg Destructo. There's some of my custom covers. Do you want you want me to zoom in on those? Oh no, I just yeah, that was just some of the that that's just a marker. You know, that's a one of a kind cover. Um, yeah, because I, I remember posting these on my page. Yeah. You posted them. Yeah. Thank you. By the way. Oh, of course, buddy. Um, and, uh, I love yeah. that one. Yeah, that's those so cool. are. The, you know, trying to do different things for for each, you know, character. Uh, that one was actually from the the newer graphic novel. We were talking about that, doing a, a live chat on the Facebook page. Um, yeah, there's a panel and some more. Yeah, so that's a panel from the new uh, book before it got colored. <laughs> Obviously. I, yeah, I love the I love the work on this. Thank you. So good. Yeah, it was it was fun because like normally I'm so under the gun with because we do you know the artists of Gore do so much fabrication that when we get into a full work cycle it's tough. It's like doing comics, doing the artwork. Oh, so we get a little zipatone there. Yeah, that that's from the '90s. That one. That one was the bad guy at the time, Skullhead Face. Uh, and, it kind of uh, reminds me of Dr. Big Brain from Detective Nobody. Yeah, it was funny because it was a character that I had taken from him to make another character, and Don sort of took that as, uh, yeah, that's our bar. That's the Gore bar. <laughs> I just love the, the expression because I've been, you know, that is in my head for life, yeah. that expression, because you make that face so all, much. All the time, yeah. Um, yeah. That... Yeah, this that that black and white one. Oh wow, you were stand the man. Yeah, that was awesome. It was great to meet him. It was <laughs> he was like, uh, maybe I'll get to I'll get you to sing a song, young man. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Look at all this shit. This is so cool. Yeah, so that that's that's Hunter right over there, uh up in the if you oh, go shit. back a little bit. Oh shit, hold on, no, no, Yeah, no. that's that's my Tron jacket. <laughs> Holy crap! You look you you kind of remind me of your dad there. Yep. 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 That was at the nine thirty club at DC. That's the new. That's the newer. That's the backstage area. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> that's some of my touring contingent. That's our guitar player, Mike Dirks on the. Uh, I guess that'd be left and then our tour managers the a guy in the middle there there's me and then there was our lighting guy at the time oh shit <laughs> oh my yeah God. we just decapitated a fan and his blood's going in the crowd <laughs> that is so messed up <laughs> yeah that's uh there's some of our and carotid stuff. Oh, and check this out. You and costume. So that's a company that me and Bob started that were doing haunted house uh, monsters. So you can see back in behind me, that's its head. It's uh, it's yeah, called Hellspawn. And it was a uh, demon that was created as a, you know, when you go to a haunted house and there's a line, basically they, you know, these, these uh, characters would herd the line into the haunted house. Yeah, that's a miniature of our temple in Antarctica where we're shooting green screen. <laughs> that is so cool, dude. What on earth is that? That is my conjoined twin. Uh, so it's a latex doll. And I had this idea of doing cute, gory things for a while. And I <laughs> that was my first. Boy. Well, I was talking about you the other day. I said... Uh, I'd never heard of a squat figure until I became friends with Matt McGuire. Yeah, yeah, right. And he was like really into squat figures. 
Yeah. And I think that fits right into that category. Yeah, that's it's it's a it's you could see like there's a production line of them picture down there too. Yep, there they are. And I was met as experiment with different colors. Somebody wanted a purple one. And I was taking I was taking orders for these years ago, but I I kind of yeah, that was like 2010. Jesus, it's sort of like uh, <laughs> you know, uh, showing this picture. I I, I just want to say um, you got to do what you love. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, you can see some of the production. That's uh that's us doing a silicon mold for a new odorous mask at the time. So that a lot of people don't know what that is, but I've actually worked with silicone and you gotta yeah. put it in, put it on one layer at a time, and it has to air dry, and then you do it again and then air dry it, and then yep. it's a pain. It is a but pain. The detail you get with it is amazing. And you can you can also cross over with material usage in the mold. So it's very, it's very efficient way to mold stuff. Um, that's me and Don Draculich. He plays Sleazy P in, in Guar. And he also plays another Destructo, which is a clan brother of Salborg Destructo. Up uh, again, I see a bit of your dad in that face right there. <laughs> I can't even remember what festival that is. <laughs> So many festivals. So many photos. Oh, I love this one. Look at this. This is cool. Yeah, that was an ad I did for the the friends thing. That is so cool. That was uh yeah, now, that, that I like that photo. And that was actually there was a version of that that was on your website for a while yeah. too. Yep. And that was a photo shoot I did with my friend Messi. And uh, disembodied leg. Well, that actually is funny because that one was for the History Channel. We actually built a gore effect for a Civil War. Uh, you know, it was a, a documentary yeah. about the Civil War, and they were they were doing the amputation. So it actually had the bone, so you could chop into the leg and do the bone. And then we had a blood tube in it so that they could squeeze it when they were filming the dude getting his leg sawed off. <laughs> it was like. That was the prop they used. That is so cool, dude. Yeah. Yeah, the first time I saw Guar, that's sort of what I saw. Yep. And I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you? What? <laughs> yeah. There's there's a high school picture there. Oh, my God. That is you back yep. in the day. Yep. That's now, I want you to confess to something right here on the show. Oh, no. And uh, let's see if you get your high school diploma taken back because you used my short story, What's <laughs> Under the Bed, to pass your final grade for and, English. Yeah. Yeah. Creative writing. I, I think it was. I think that's what I don't recall. I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, hey, Goob, uh, I don't have enough uh, time to get a story written. Uh, <laughs> Could I use your story? <laughs> Fuck it. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and I still plan to do that. Maybe that's what we could do together because we both have that connective thing is uh, turn that into uh, either a comic or a, a live action film. Yeah. Yeah. And um, my God, that was it, it was a funny story because it came from a real nightmare I had, which is why it was so cool. Um, these are great photos, man. Hey. Oh shit! Somebody looks like Phil Collins. Someone looks like <laughs> Phil Collins. Wonder who it is. <laughs> oh, look at that picture, Jesus! I haven't even looked at these pictures in forever. <laughs> I like that one. That's typical Matt right there. And this one I saw on your website too. That's the one I remember. <laughs> that was at my brother's wedding. <laughs> is that from you? It really. Yeah, so my my friend was like, "You look like, uh, what's the agent from uh, the Matrix?" Mr. Agent Smith. Smith. Yeah, Agent Smith. It's, yeah, he's like, "You should do something like that." She was like, "You you look like him. You should do something like that." Uh, that was at a convention. My friend Megan was dressed as Poison Ivy. She's a cutie patootie. That's yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to close that window down. Well, I think we pretty much. Uh, talk for over an hour uh, about an hour and 40 minutes um 
I mean, I didn't start recording until we're it's because I realized, well, I think it's just gonna be you and me. And so uh, I'm like, fuck it, I'm, I'm just gonna go, start recording. Maybe next time we get everybody in. <laughs> well, I want to have you on again. Uh yeah. is there anything in particular that you want to promote right now? Well, right now we're actually in the middle of our our sales for our uh, coronavirus into the world sale just ended t today and tomorrow there's going to be an exclusive uh, comic book shirt uh, uh, print on demand uh, shirts uh, uh, bundled with this new graphic novel right here the enormagantic fail so this will be with shirts with artwork from the other books and you can get a pretty good deal you get the book and a shirt uh, That'll be on sale tomorrow. Uh, what is the um, uh, address for that? Uh, that's at any merch. Uh, in fact, it's uh, blah, blah, blah. let me double check because they just sent me all. Yeah, just send it. Send it to me in a, a message. I'll copy and paste okay. it and put it on the screen here. Right on. Let's see, yeah, it's uh, uh, gwar hyphen store dot com is where you'd want to go to get gwar your cool store dot com. Yep. Your cool gore stuff. HTTP colon support slash. Unfortunately, the coronavirus has slowed down our release of our card game. That is was that, to... is that the correct address? Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, gore hyphen store dot com. That is it right there. That's where you want to go. So, if you want to go pick up that graphic novel and get the shirt with it, uh, how much is that going for? Uh, we're gonna. I think we're doing thirty for the whole bundle. That's pretty uh, good because most graphic novels are uh, twenty dollars. Yep. And um, which is you know a solid price for a graphic novel. Uh, how many pages is it? Uh, that one's a hundred and I think it came out to a hundred and oh shoot, it's a hundred plus pages. It's it's yeah because the the standard price uh, for a uh, hundred to hundred four page graphic novel is nineteen ninety five. I yep. love networking for IDW. <laughs> Yeah, and and uh, this one's pretty good because this one is an explanation of why Gwar is on Earth. This this is the blunder. This is the screw up that has sent them to Earth. So it now, explains that. Matt, do you have your your uh, fan site set up yet, or are you still uh, under construction? I'm still working on that. Uh, I'm going. Let's to see. How, the first time I asked you about that was in 2002, and uh, that was. Uh, 18 years ago, you've like, been working on that website. Site. I had a website. In fact, I wish I could turn my computer around because I have the header for it right there. And it went to, I think it made it to 2010. And then I started doing my own stuff through, I started my other company. I started doing stuff on Shopify. So it's been this, like, how do I get myself to do personal stuff in between all that? So, not trying to make it a bunch of excuses, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I'm 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 in the I'm in the process of ramping up all that stuff again. Uh, I'm going to create my own Shopify store and my own web page for you know directing all that traffic around because my Instagram page for Sawbore Constructo and unfortunately my Facebook page is a little, eh, but the, the Instagram pages I'm posting up things pretty much every day now. Um, so new content, artwork in process, sculptures in process, things like that. They're all over Instagram. When you post on Facebook, tag me. Uh, okay. That way I'll yeah. know to repost it on my page. Oh, that'd be I'll great. also post it on our, uh, even though we're called Pop Culture Minefield, our Facebook page is Dangerous Nerds because <laughs> that's, oh, right. Right. that's what, how it got started because it was a bunch of nerds that were military vets. Yeah. And, uh, and then I started accepting people that just, support the military and oh, yeah. uh, which of course your dad you know is uh, a huge inspiration for me when i was younger uh going into the military myself i'm like i hope i'm as much a badass as his dad was yeah. man he's like 72 and he's like freaking still he's a beast like we're at the gym doing stuff and he's like tuk, tuk, tuk. <laughs> it's like ah. are they on facebook are your parents on facebook no no, my mom. My mom is scared of this. I want. <laughs> I wanted to say hi to your dad so badly. Oh yeah, no. And, I actually told him that I was uh, talking to you again. They said hello. 
I, I would really like to say hi to him again sometime. So uh, we need to talk. Well, uh, next, time, next time I'm uh, th there, I'll have to you get know, him Skype. on the phone with you yeah. so I can talk. You can Skype or we FaceTime or something. Because I really want him to know that when I went into the military, I wanted to go Marines first. But I found oh, out. Yeah. <laughs> I found out the Marines don't have their own medics. Yeah, it's unfortunate, right? You have to join the Navy. And if you join the Navy and become a hospital corpsman in the Navy, you're not guaranteed to go to a Marine unit. You may end up in a Naval hospital. And I'm right. like, I really don't want to be in the Navy. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no, I'm not disparaging the Navy. It's just not my thing. Right. And um, I, so I became an ar uh, Army combat medic. Nice. And uh, But he inspired me to want to join the military. And uh, he yeah, just, I was... He just retired. Like he just, he he retired the Marine Corps. Uh, oh, geez, that yeah. So he, he basically was doing the same job, still working for the military. Right. He just retired from that. Like she six months ago. Not even that. Well, uh, I'll wrap it up here, buddy. But yeah, uh, this it was is amazing not, talking this to you. Is not the last time we're going to do the show. I want to get you back on again. Uh, especially anytime you want to t sell something, but I'd like to just get you on it because I like shooting the breeze with you. Yeah, man, it was I great. Mean, you and I used to just hang around and talk this shit all the time, and I, oh, yeah, I'd like to get back. I, I would like to really talk more about comics, but I needed to keep moving into other yeah. stuff. But uh, that's once again more reason to get you on here because uh, I think you see things the way I see it with the industry. Yeah, and um, uh, and we need to do a comic book, and uh, I think Detective Noti needs to be the first thing we do. Yeah, that'd be fun. And I, maybe that what's out of the bed, what's under the bed, should be, be the next too. thing we do. That'd you know, fun. and you completely draw it. I'll write it. <laughs> oh, all right, and okay. I'll do. I'll, I'll do the that fast. <laughs> I'll do the inks. I'll do the inks, and I'll do the letter. I'll do all the hard labor work. Just do this. Just pencil it out, and I'll get the rest done, and we'll we'll, we'll, we'll kick some ass. And um, and hell, if you do tighten the pencils, I, I always tell people, don't even bother inking. Uh, You're yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I've done that where my pencils or Bonk has done it. Oh my God, Richard Bonk. My God, he'll sometimes he'll throw down some pencils, and I'm like, I, I didn't even what want do I to do? eat this. <laughs> I, it's like this is so beautiful. Yeah. You know, if I ink this, it's going to ruin it. <laughs> or Stewie, Stewie would say. Ruin it, Brian. Ruin. Ruin it. Ruin it. Ruin it. <laughs> anyway, buddy, it's good talking to you. Thanks yeah, for coming man. on, man. And uh, I'll talk to you real soon. And please, the next time you talk to your mom and dad, say hi to him again for me because uh, uh -huh. I, I always will. think about you guys. I always think about them. Hell yeah, man. All right, brother. Take care and live long and <laughs> prosper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cool.